think about ethics in a different way when we're studying vulnerable populations. And that's because they often cannot communicate to us things that other populations can. If you think about research with young adults versus research with infants or young children, it has to be done very differently. And that's because in research with infants or young children, you have to pay more attention to protection from harm. They often can't tell you or won't tell you if they're uncomfortable with something. So you have to think and try and take their perspective to understand what their needs will be. For instance, children need age appropriate breaks. About 20 minutes in a lab at a time is all they can handle without taking a walk around the building or having a play break or having some sort of way to decompress. We also know that they need physical comfort and that they aren't gonna develop eye strain or any type of straining exhaustion. We also need to make sure they understand and consent to what's going on. And especially if you're recruiting through schools, it can be a lot more complicated to get informed consent. We know that after you pass university ethics, which can take quite a long time, you have to submit an ethics proposal to a school board. That can also take a long time. Once you have that, then you have to contact principals. And if principals are on board, then you contact individual teachers. And if individual teachers are on board, then you send letters of consent home to parents who often forget to resubmit them, so you have to send them lots of reminders that are not coercive reminders. And then on the day of the study and you show up, you have to make sure the school-aged child gives verbal assent if they're of a certain age. And so it's the idea where you say, hey, you want to come with me and do a study? They have to say, sure. And if that child says, no, I want to sit here, we're watching a play today, or we're going to gym class, or I really want to do my math test, you have to say, okay. And most labs will say you can, you can ask them twice in, in the time you're working in the school and doing your data, but you can't be coercive and you can't ask them more than that. So even after months of getting university, school board, principal, teacher, parent approval, if that child says, no, I don't feel like it, you have to respect that and not force them to participate in your study. Finally, you have to be very careful with the confidentiality of the data, especially with school age kids. If you're getting all those levels of consent, you might have a lot of people that think they have the right to the data. You might have parents that want to know how their child did on a test. And if that's not something that's in your letter of consent and you didn't tell the child their parent would see their answers, you can't show them. You might have a teacher that wants to see how the students in their class did or a principal who wants to know the school level findings. And unless you have that in your letter of consent and all parties have agreed to that, you cannot show that. And so that's something you have to think about that when you first plan your original ethics proposal with the university research board. And it's something you have to be prepared for and how it'll change the validity of your measurements if other people get to see the outcomes of those measures and how that'll change the risk and protection from harm of your participants if their parents get to find out how they're doing and if their teachers get to find out how they're doing. So because of that, the ethical considerations with vulnerable populations cannot be underestimated. Finally, I just want to talk about briefly about what's going on in developmental research methods in contemporary times. And so today in development, although we started off as a very hybrid, holistic field, we've come together pretty nicely. And one of the biggest uh, areas to find developmental psychologists in the globe is through the Society for Research and Child Development, also known as SRCD. This is a society that meets once every two years and sometimes has up to 10,000 conference presentations in a four day span. It's one of the best ways to go and visit and see all the really cutting edge research in developmental psychology. Now at SRCD, we also see research published on infants and adolescents and even emerging adults, but there is two special societies just for research on adolescents and emerging adults that specialize in them and meet every two years as well. Then here in Canada, we also have the Pickering Center for Human Development, which hosts research conferences once every four years for all developmental psychologists across Canada. Just to give you a, a view of what the field looks like today. So thanks very much for paying attention to Unit 1 and this nice overview of developmental research methods.